I went to Africa the first time with no real interest in painting Africa. There was a very quick transformation within me. To see these incredible species in the wild was just awe-inspiring. It was stunning to witness that cycle of life from so close. I realized that this is what I want to paint the rest of my life. I tell people that the menagerie is 17 years in the making. I mean, the seed was planted probably many years prior to that. My mother, Virginia, was very artistic, but she ended up rearing nine children instead of pursuing a professional art career. Everybody in the family was way above average uh, artistically. I didn't realize I had any particular uh, talent till I got to kindergarten and we started doing our art projects. You know, I'm doing three-dimensional shadow light figures and glance over at my classmate who's doing crude stick figures. It was a big deal. I mean, your first idea that maybe you can do something special. Our house was right on the edge of town and right behind the house 15, 20 feet was the St. Louis River, and I spent my entire summer out there playing it. It kind of felt like Tom Sawyer, Huck Finn. Well, my first experience uh, with regards to menagerie was as a very young child, having the desire to create these live collections of different species. And of course, later on, I became aware that over the course of history, uh, various artists have had painted menagerie-type pieces. Through my teenage years, I was doing pencil, pen and ink portraits of friends that I knew, you know, rock stars, things like that. It wasn't until later that I, I refocused and combined my love for wildlife with, uh, with the art. My family has a railroad background, and uh, my father worked there for 40 years. And sadly for me, I got hired three days after I graduated from high school. I just fell into the groove of being a railroader. Well, it was very physical. I was in the track department, so, you know, it was pounding spikes and lifting a lot of heavy things. There was a stretch of time there where maybe Six years, I never even touched a pencil. But curiously, I, I still always thought at some point in time I was going to be an artist. My mother had seen in the paper that the uh, Minnesota duck stamp and the federal duck stamp were actually art contests. And at that point in time, I said, wow, this is it. I love wildlife. I love art. Win the duck stamp and become a professional artist. The problem was I was competing against the, the greatest wildlife artists in the world. Minnesota artists were winning uh, three out of every four federal duck stamp competitions. I knew I couldn't possibly win it by doing a black and white. I had to decide to start teaching myself how to paint. That was a huge transition to go from pencil and pen and ink to color and I would do one tiny six by nine inch painting each year. And that was my total output for the year. So you can imagine the despair I would feel when I, when I wouldn't succeed that year. And I think every year after the judging, I would say, that's it, I'm not doing this anymore. But before I got home from the cities from watching that year's competition, I was already scheming for the following year. I'd been entering the stamp competition for now six or seven years. I had placed fourth one year, so I, I knew I was capable of winning, but then I went through a stretch of a couple, two, three years where my work didn't even advance in the competition, and it was perplexing to me because uh, I thought they were some of my best work. I started to become rather discouraged. I had kind of made the decision, I'm gonna take one more crack at this. I did a nice piece, pair of bluebills on lavender water, and I thought, this looks like a duck stamp. And curiously, the night before the judging, I got a call from the head of the DNR. He said, Brian, just calling to confirm that your, your entry is actually a painting. I said, yeah, it, it's, a, it's an oil painting. He said, well, the reason I'm asking is a couple of years ago, you know, you had a piece that was in the finals and just before they judged the finals, one of the ju three judges says, uh, I don't think this piece is a painting. I think it's some sort of photo process. 
that phone call was very discouraging. I thought, well, I don't think I have a chance then. That was going to be my last serious attempt at uh, being a professional artist. I was looking at 30 more years of railroading and eventually retiring from there. Lo and behold, I won. You just never know how things are going to play out. I was commissioned by a publisher from the West Coast who wanted to put together a six artist portfolio of Africa. The sights, the sounds, the smells, it felt like landing on another planet. To travel through Nairobi was jaw dropping. Of course it got even better once we got out into the field. Everything it was more out in the open. You could witness the cycle of life on a regular basis. There was something very intriguing about that to me. Well, once I realized how visible the wildlife was there, I started immediately thinking about different storylines for paintings, high drama pieces, interaction between predator and prey, and so that excited me right away. You know, as a wildlife artist, your thoughts of conservation go hand in hand with what you do. I've returned to some of the places that I went on on that first safari and you would see a village once every 20, 30 miles. Now it's just, you, you don't ever seem to leave a village. The human encroachment on the wild areas there is an incredible problem. Even the game reserves, which you think those boundaries are solid, they are not. Each year the human population moves in a little bit farther on these so-called reserves. So you can imagine what's happening outside of the reserves. There are tremendous issues with poaching. Poaching is rampant in Africa. I've been with groups where they've removed a hundred foot traps and snares in one day. These things kill animals indiscriminately. I've seen elephants with their trunks missing. Cape buffalo limping around on three legs. I never want to say it's a lost cause. There's a tremendous challenge. Describing me as being obsessed is probably an understatement. Once I get on to an idea, if I think it's a good one, I generally don't let go of it very easily. You know, from the very beginning, it's, I'm sure it was always at least 12 hours a day. And in the last, well, probably three, four months ago, it ramped up to 18 hour days. And now down the home stretch, it's 20 hour days. I don't really worry about when I go to bed. I just worry about how much time I spend in bed. So I just set my phone clock whenever I decide to go down for four hours. Failure is not an option. This work has created challenges that I've never experienced. If you can imagine, 209 different species, and every one of these species has to be scaled properly in relation to every single other species in here. The painting's not going to be convincing if you don't pull that off. Man has been incorporated into the menagerie. He's been summoned to this gathering of the species to answer for some of his previous actions. So I was getting on a plane to come out here and they said, where are you going? I said, Grand Rapids. They said, what are you gonna do? I'm coming out for an event to honor Brian Jarvie and they said, oh, isn't he that duck stamp artist? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, when was the last time you saw Brian Jarvie and he said, about 30, 35 years ago. And I said, you haven't been paying attention. This local exhibition, which is going to go directly onto a national tour from here, is uh, the African Menagerie. It's a 30 foot long painting on seven panels, features over two, 209 species of, of Africa. This work is unprecedented in scale and size, and this is a narrative painting that speaks to our time. We are on the nose cone of the sixth major species extinction episode. This sixth extinction episode is caused by one species. That's us. So when you see Brian's piece tonight, one of the things I'd like you to think about is what animals are going to be there in another generation. The world's leading scientists have said that by the middle of this century, 
We could lose elephants, we could lose rhinos, we could lose lions in the wild, and if they exist at all, they're only going to exist in captivity in zoos. It's an anxious day, uh, setting it up, because like I say, you can't, can't really see the whole thing in the studio. 50 years from now, if things continue in the direction they are, maybe 50% of these species will be extinct. The most effective thing that could happen with this piece is it, it could send out a great conservation message.